So welcome to another episode of Wiki Weekends, a series where myself and my ever-lovely co-host, Lucas Holland... Hello there. ...scour the lengths and breadths of the internet to find a wiki entry on something we want to talk about to see what kind of conversation it elicits. And today we're talking about one of the original prestige television shows, The Sopranos. All I know is you never had the makings of a varsity athlete. A son of a bitch! So specifically, Lucas, we are talking about the main character of The Sopranos, Tony Soprano. And before we get into it, first of all, like a link to the wiki entry we're reading can be found below. But Lucas, what's your history with the Sopranos TV show? Presumably you are aware of it via reputation and no doubt pop culture osmosis, but it was kind of before our time. A little bit in terms of watching like a mature TV show. And that yeah. means to, to I haven't it. actually watched it. Um, uh, so yeah, I've talked to you about it quite a few times because i know you're a big fan and through editing videos where we talk about it i've also learned that like m you know big fat italian men in that universe can teleport there are, there are so many large italian men on the sopranos uh, to the point where i think james gandolfini who plays the topic of today's video um, uh, Tony Soprano put on like close to a hundred pounds by playing Tony Ooh. because they would literally eat just entire meals while filming scenes <laughs> <laughs> like there is like a two hour super cut on YouTube that's just all the times in the Sopranos where they're eating food oh my god <laughs> like one of my favorite you know, fuck it, we're gonna talk about my favorite Sopranos you've already set me off Lucas like, <laughs> there is like a recurring thing of Tony Soprano eating deli meat <laughs> ah, yeah, he's got like gabagool. It's just a funny oh, word to say. Gabagool, yeah. There's a okay. bit where he's so mad that his daughter is dating a black guy that he runs into the kitchen and angrily eats deli meat. And then he has a panic attack when he sees a packet of Uncle Ben's rice. He's such an arsehole. Uncle Ben's rice gives him a panic attack. He's got a black dude on it. Jesus Christ. But, like, that's, that's I guess, one other thing that I've um, heard about through, like, you know, just osmosis is just people going, like, the Gabagool. The Gabagool, yeah. Also, so just the fact that The Sopranos is pitched as and remembered as, like, you know, just this crime drama. But I contend it's probably one of the funniest TV shows ever made. And it has... Very good examples of just dark humour and outright just great jokes. Oh, look at that. It's like an ad for a fucking weight loss centre. Before and way before. This guy ever stopped breaking balls. And it's similar to, like, you know, other prestige television shows that came in its wake, like Breaking Bad, which for the first couple of seasons, I'd argue, was like pretty much a comedy. There are some really great comedy moments in those early seasons of Breaking Bad. And later seasons, of course, when there's moments of levity, but the show slowly becomes darker and darker until it reaches its um, climax, similar to The Sopranos. But there are still funny moments in that show. What are you building? You said it yourself. A robot? A battery. <laughs> yeah, but it definitely in the first couple of seasons leans into it a bit more where, yeah, it's a dark show and it's a dark premise, but like... There are a lot of moments of like comedy and levity, and oh my god, my dogs are kicking the fuck off. It's because they agree, they like Tony Soprano. Hey, how are you? I'm sorry, Tony. I'm sorry. Just push her away. No, she's alright. And for an example of what I'm talking about, consider the very first episode of The Sopranos, where it's Tony Soprano just talking to his therapist and he's remembering what he did that day. And what he did that day was run a man down in his car. <laughs> Okay, standard crime boss stuff, but the actual way it's framed is Tony's like wistfully thinking back to when he run a guy down in his car and you see him smiling. Like he's having such a good time chasing this guy in his car. And his therapist's like, so what did you do with the man? He's like, we had coffee. We had coffee. Where's my fucking money? So you had coffee. Right. It's like, it's perfect. It's Perfect tone setting for that universe of like, oh yeah, here's Tony Soprano running a guy down in his car, having a great time. And then he's like, just smash cuts to him. No, we had coffee. We had coffee. 
And like, is that that they genuinely had coffee, or is he just reminiscing about like putting him in a hole somewhere? I can't remember off the top of my head because my rewatch right. of it happened during the pandemic. But the reason mm-hmm. I wanted to talk about it today is because a friend of mine is doing his like yearly rewatch, and we were talking about it a couple of days ago, and we were just right, remembering okay. like how funny the show was. So, uh, you know, maybe I'll double check when I put the clip in because, yeah, I'm going to put lots of clips in in this episode. But, yeah, my rewatch was during the pandemic a couple of years ago, but I was just reminded of how much I enjoy The Sopranos because just talking about with a friend, I'm like, man, there's so many funny moments in this show. Just just Tony Soprano angrily eating deli meat because he's so racist. <laughs> it's like, it's so surreal. But getting back to the wiki entry itself, Anthony John Soprano Sr. is a fictional character and protagonist of the HBO crime drama television series The Sopranos, portrayed by the late great James Gandolfini. And it's like, you know, just James Gandolfini, just like one of those, like those talents taken way too young, died a few years ago at the age of 51. Shit, I wasn't aware he passed away. He, he passed away very, like, you know, 51 and yeah, widely fuck. considered one of the greatest living actors while he was, like, you know, mm-hmm. doing The Sopranos. Because, like, his, like, just acting range and chops were fucking phenomenal. And Gandolfini was one of those, like, rare acting talents where just every time you ever see anyone talk about them, all people say is, like, phenomenal, absolute, just top of his class, untouchable. And a weird little thing that I saw not long ago was actually, like, a picture of, like, oh, here's James Gandolfini in high school just dunking a basketball. It's like, <laughs> the man could dunk. <laughs> What's the thing? Because he was in really good shape, and no doubt we'll get into it in this wiki entry. And he was cast because of his large physical stature, because, you know, he mm. was a very physically imposing man, which you kind of need to be when you're a mob boss. But, you know, getting back to the wiki entry here, usually referred to as Tony, the character was conceived by Soprano's creator and showrunner, David Chase, who was largely responsible for the character's story arc throughout the show's sixth season. And, you know, just for anyone just curious about, you know, just Soprano's background, like, you know, within the series itself, he is a member of the Italian-American Mafia, and especially later in the series, acts as the boss of the fictional North Jersey DeMio crime family, later called the Soprano crime family. A lot happens in this show, and the thing that I most remember is just how just good the acting is. And just how funny it is. That's the weird thing that you look back, it's like, it's really funny. Like, to the point where it has almost, like, I'd say Vine level editing. Where's my fucking money? So you had coffee. Right. Mm. And when I say Vine level editing, I just mean like really sharp, like just snap cuts to something unexpected, which within the realm of the show is used to show surprise. But looking back with a modern eye, it becomes funny. And I think the example that you'll know, Lucas, you grabbed a clip for it for a Fact Fiend episode, is just when people get shot, people, you don't see the, like, the gunman walk into frame. They just, <laughs> it just cuts to a guy with a gun opening fire because, you know, <laughs> to symbolize the surprise. But you're laughing, right? And I can see you laughing because yeah. just, it's really funny out of context to just see like a guy sat in a car and then a, a, just an overweight Italian man just like teleport into frame and just opens fire <laughs> with a gun. It's just um, the one where it's like under the underpass, and they're like, they, you know, the, they deal with the deal. Yeah, I'm a drug and deal. And they get back into the van and they start having a conversation and start talking about like women problems. And then, like, literally a second later, they're just being shot in the head. Don't say jack shit to Kaisha about this, or she'll be haunting my ass for that child. So- that led to one of my favorite, just like jokey fan theories about the Sopranos that in the Sopranos universe Italian Americans can teleport and no one talks about (laughs) it because that's the only way to explain how characters like Tony Soprano and his ilk are able to sneak up on people because to put it diplomatically they are men of a larger carriage than the average Mm -hmm. well there are some big boys on the Sopranos and they are somehow able to sneak up on people in some cases like hardened gangsters who are paranoid as all fuck and the only explanation is that they just teleport (laughs) and if you watch the show it kind of looks like they have the ability to teleport yeah because this shots were you know they'll be able to sneak up on someone and they're five foot away behind the person on like a pavement so you'd hear them walking they just 
no one notices they're there. And like I said, that wasn't the intention, but again, just looking back with a modern eye, it does become funny. And obviously those scenes weren't intended to be humorous. They were intended to be shocking and violent. But, you know, mm -hmm. it's the beauty of media that it, the way you respond to it can change over time. You know, yes. obviously I still think the show is a fantastic drama, but, you know, because I know all the beats, I know all the beats, I know all the characters, you know, mm -hmm. I can watch it in a way where it's like, okay, now I know what's the rough overall story, what's going to happen. Let's just enjoy those little character moments. Yeah, and you mentioned Breaking Bad earlier, and in a very different way, I think um, watching it on repeat viewing drastically changes the way that you view that show. Absolutely, yes. And uh, like Breaking Bad is another show that I like rewatch. Like um, I'll rewatch Breaking Bad more than I rewatch The Sopranos. But Breaking Bad is a show that I highly recommend people who saw once go back and watch again with the knowledge that Walt was always an asshole. Cyber begging. That's all that is. Just rattling a little tin cup to the entire world. Yeah, there's no deep-seated issues there. I recently did that and got up to, like, season three and stopped watching because I was that infuriated by Walter White by that point. But in the first watch, you genuinely do root for him because the way that the story's told. Yeah, and it's not until later in the series you get that gut punch moment. I believe it's the moment when he's talking to Gretchen from Grey Matter. Mm. Well, like, you know, he meets up with her and she asks him, like, Walt, what happened to you? And, like, you see Walt angrily yelling at her, of like, oh, you, you sold me out, you ran off with my best friend. And she says, no, I didn't. You left me. That's your excuse? To build your little empire on my work? How can you say that to me? You walked away. You, you abandoned us. Me, Elliot. Little rich girl just adding to your millions. And how familiar are you, Lucas, with the story of Grey Matter as it's presented in the Breaking Bad show? Um, Like, relatively. I remember most of it, I would assume, but... You know, I'm sure there's little details that I haven't remembered. Oh, okay, well, how is it presented from Walt's point of view throughout the show? The way that Walt always makes it out is as if, oh, you know, I was dating Gretchen, I made a company with my best friend, and both of them basically conspired against me to steal my company from me, kick me out, and then get together. Yeah, and then they became billionaires off of his work. And he even mm -hmm. notes that they gave him $5,000 and like, you know, made billions off of the work that they stole from him. The actual story is, because you, you believe that, because you know, Walt's the protagonist, you want to believe Walt, but when you have that moment with Gretchen where he says, you left us, there is a interview with Vince Gilligan, the writer, where he talks about how, well, yeah, well, it's not directly said in the show, but the actress who plays Gretchen, we told her the backstory, which is, you know, I'm going to paraphrase it now. Um, her and Walt were together. Um, they were very happy together then. They went to visit Gretchen's family, and Walter realized that Gretchen's family were independently wealthy. And as a result, she didn't really need, quote-unquote, Walter, and his ego couldn't deal with the fact that she was wealthier and more important than he was. He threw a tantrum and left, and then sold his shares in Grey Matter for $5,000 because his ego wouldn't let him believe that they could do it without him. They took his work and made it into, like, you know, a several billion dollar company. It's entirely 100% his fault. Well, he had cut me out. What? My hard work, my research, and you and Elliot make millions off it. That cannot be how you see it. Oh. And it, you know, falls in line with the fact that when they find out his um, cancer diagnosis, they literally say to him, well, we will cover everything. Like, we appreciate all the work you put in. We used to be, you know, a part she used to date him. We used to be business partners and best friends. Like, we owe you this much, and we do not feel, you know, bad about it. Just let us pay for everything and his ego will not allow him to not be you know the person who fixes everything in his life and supports his family is his ego is just too much and he therefore decides that he has to go and become a fucking meth dealer to do it and when you rewatch the show with the idea that walter white is always an arsehole in mind it just recontextualizes almost every single scene that he's in like when he's talking to Saul. And Saul's like, hey, um, here are three completely reasonable solutions for how we can get your money into your family's hands to help pay for your cancer treatments. We can invent a fictitious dead relative. You can win it from a casino. You can find it under a bridge. And like, no, they have to know. My family has to know that I earned it. And Saul just goes, mm -hmm. no underlying issues there. And it just yep, straight up, it's 100% his problem. 
It's like, we could launder your money immediately right now and give your family just everything that they could ever need without having to hide this money behind their back. And he's like, nope, I need them to know when I'm dead that I earned that money myself. And there it is. And that's like, you know, not the first hint. It's one of many, many hints that Walter doesn't actually care about the money. He cares about the power. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing he cares about. I feel so sorry for you, Walt. You. But getting back to The Sopranos, casting. James Gandolfini was invited to audition for the part of Tony Soprano after casting director Susan Fitzgerald saw a short clip of his performance in the 1993 film, True Romance. Hit the clip. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Let me see those eyes. And he ultimately received the role ahead of several other actors due to his large stature and acting range. And presumably the fact he could dunk a basketball. <laughs> Yeah, apparently. I, just, I, I didn't know that about James Gandolfini, but that's kind of awesome that just he could dunk in a basketball. <laughs> um, does it mention, like, the other actors he was up in contention against? Yeah, it mentions a couple here. There was um, uh, Anthony LaPaglia, uh, who most people might recognise as um, Daphne's brother from Frasier. At least that's how I recognise him. <laughs> right. Um, he decided not to go with it and was not considered further. Series creator David Chase invited Stephen Van Zant, who was the guitarist in Bruce Springsteen's E Street Band, <laughs> to audition for the role. <laughs> Okay. Zant, who had never acted before, felt the role should go to an actual actor, so Chase wrote him a part that did not exist in the original script, Silvio Dante. <laughs> One of the cool things is that, you know, he absolutely knocks it out of the park as Silvio, but as well, they frequently just play Bruce Springsteen songs when he's in scenes. So I'm presuming David Chase is just a Springsteen fan then. He's, he's just a fan of like, you know, a lot of classic media. Like, you know, obviously Goodfellas and um, Godfather being like huge influences on the Sopranos tone. Mm -hmm. And just like, yeah, there's a, and music as well played a huge part in the Sopranos, which is probably going to make putting clips in very difficult because a lot of the key pivotal scenes have music in the background, which is not great for when you try to put clips on YouTube. Yeah, I did notice it felt a bit you know weird when looking for clips because it's very i think more to towards the like 2000 style of tv where there's a lot of licensed soundtrack in there There is indeed yes you know the, the, that licensed soundtrack does add to the overall feel of the show but it does make it very difficult to put clips in of because some of the best <laughs> yeah. moments in the show have soundtracks like tony soprano running people over in his car that has a soundtrack in the background so i guess oh. if i can't get that clip in without it being copyright struck i'll instead put in the clip of tony soprano playing mario kart Oh, yeah. <laughs> Is that just great shots of him playing Mario Kart and absolutely fucking whooping ass? Go. Watch out for the ghost. This thing ain't steering right. As methods to focus anger into his performance, Gandolfini said he would deliberately hit himself on the head, stay up all night to evoke the desired reaction, drink several cups of coffee, or walk around with a rock inside of his shoe. Oh. So he just do you know just to get himself like worked up or frustrated. Yeah. For fuck's sake. And that does make sense. It's just like the idea of putting a rock in your shoe and then not going to sleep all night just to be able to, you know, correctly be pissed off in the next day for shooting. But it's also to actually look suitably paranoid, like scenes where he's like paranoid or just knackered. It's like it's mm. really hard to fake that so just why not just turn up completely fucking knackered and there's a few yeah. moments in the show that i, I want to single out as being like you know just genuinely good performances and i think the one that i think is one of the fan favorite moments from one of the fan favorite episodes myself included is the pine barons episode which is where just two of the characters get lost in the woods and have an adventure which is oh, okay it's, it's, it's really fun but um one of the moments in it is where like the two guys were lost in the woods. They call up Tony and like, can you please come get us? We're lost in the woods. And Tony's like, for <laughs> fuck's sake, okay, I'll come get you. And he calls up his friend Bobby. And he's like, Bobby, I need you to come help me. And he turns up in like full hunting gear. But he's like wearing like a giant fluorescent vest and a big hat. And the behind the scenes story is that the actor walked in wearing a giant strap on dildo. What? Just because they wanted to get uh, the the script called for Tony Soprano to laugh. Right, so the okay. actor did that and no one told Gandolfini about it. And his reaction in the shot is 100% <laughs> genuine.
<laughs> of him just completely breaking the fuck down. And he even does a thing where he goes, he's like that, and he looks back up and just goes again. <laughs> <laughs> fuck this. Where are you going? It's like, I mean, you wouldn't expect that to happen, right? Like, that's the last thing you expect. Well, apparently, like, his reaction of just completely breaking down is 100% 100% genuine. And he found me the biggest dildo. It looked like an Italian bread. And when I come into that room, which is the scene you see, I'm off camera, and you see Jim basically fall over <laughs> laughing on the counter. And you could almost catch Dominic <laughs> being easy, crack a smile. <laughs> That was a funny scene. We had a lot of laughs that day. And, and I do like when there's moments like that in um, uh, like films and TV shows of just, they do something unexpected to elicit a more genuine reaction, like uh, another example for something we talked about recently, Terminator 2. Do you like where mm -hmm. like Arnold Schwarzenegger walks into the bar naked and everyone just looks oh, at yeah. him and acts really surprised? To get the desired reaction, Arnold Schwarzenegger got the smallest pair of, like, garish booty shorts he could find. <laughs> so when you see everyone looking down and going, huh? It's because they've just seen Arnold Schwarzenegger walk in wearing the tiniest pair of, like, booty shorts you've ever seen. <laughs> and, and in that vein, Lucas, are there any moments from, like, TV or film that you're aware of where, like, you know, someone's reaction was 100% genuine and it made it into the final product? I mean, one that I've mentioned a few times that I absolutely love is just in It's Always Sunny, like that moment when they're trying to get them to go to the like apocalypse bunker and Charlie just cannot hold it together. He turns entirely around. Do you have boyfriends? How did you not know? The thing is, that's the example we always use, and it always makes me laugh because just yeah. the fact that Charlie Day turns all the way around. <laughs> And you don't notice it. And then you see, yeah, like Charlie Day legit just turns all the way around and you can see him heaving with laughter. That the reason I invited you back to my bar was to bang you. Get out of here. There's quite a lot of um, moments in It's Always Sunny, especially the first, like, you know, maybe like <laughs> fucking 10 seasons where they tried to keep the production down a little bit. But like, you can tell that they're breaking, but they keep it in. But just every time, it's that one moment because no other time do they turn the entire way around yeah, to stop themselves not like being a shown. Smirk or a smile. It's like legitimate, uncontrollable laughter that they have to like turn around and like bite their fist to stop. Mm -hmm. An example that I really like is an old sitcom I'm a fan of, Only Fools and Horses. And to set the scene of what's happening, it's um, uh, like it's Del Boy, his wife um, Raquel, and their uncle Albert. And they're all concocting a plan because um, uh, Del Boy's brother, Rodney, has gone on a date with another woman, or he's planning to go on a date with another woman, um, to make his wife jealous. And if Rodney gets seen with this Tanya sort, then, well, it's going to break Cassandra's heart, and then Rodney's going to find himself with the sack. Del is trying to, you know, concoct a plan to make Rodney realise the error of his ways. And he tells his uncle, I need you act really really surprised when he says what he's going to do. When Rodney tells us about this date with this bird, right, you and me have got to look absolutely horrified. And Uncle Albert's like, don't worry, I've got this. He's like, okay, okay, okay. He's like, oh, so, Rodney, what are you up to tonight? Oh, I'm going out. And Uncle Albert goes, <gasps> Now, don't forget, you've got to look horrified, right? As though you've seen a U-boat off the starboard bow. <laughs> <laughs> but like he does it like four times and you can legitimately see Del Boy's actor David Jason crack a smile because he didn't expect that noise. You see him like try to like contain laughter, like stop it, stop it. Going on your own? No. Going with someone. <laughs> <laughs> I'll whack you one in a minute, believe me. And the fact it made it into the show is like fantastic. That's a really good scene, and um, another one that I enjoy in terms of like sh making stupid noises is um, in Friends when Ross is showing off his bagpipe skills after training for a bit, and um, Phoebe just starts like mimicking and singing along, quote unquote, with the bagpipes, and Jennifer Aniston just can't hold it together at the all. You know the song, sing along. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha! 
I don't think anything will just ever top the always sunny one. Although the James Gandolfini completely breaking character is up there. Because <laughs> it's such a genuine, heartfelt laugh. And just when you hear the story of like, yeah, like he could not get it together. We had to like stop filming for like five minutes because he could not stop <laughs> laughing. But in the vein of The Sopranos, Lucas, let's completely wildly change the tone now. Narrated killings committed by Tony Soprano. That's an actual subheading on Wikipedia. <laughs> That's a tone shit. So Tony has personally committed eight murders during the show. That's less than I thought. But he also, like, you know, authorised the killing of several others. So he's personally killed eight people, but he's like, you know, responsible for the deaths of uh, countless more. That's the thing, when you're at the top, it's a lot of telling other people to go kill someone, right? And this is a great example of something I've talked about before and will no doubt talk about again. And it's the idea of the ability to just binge watch television now Mm -hmm. really changes the way you view some older series. And The Sopranos is one of them where, like, Throughout the show, it's like the FBI being like, There's n- we can't nail Tony Soprano. Like, the guy's a ghost. We can't we can't ever pin anything on him. And like I said, the first episode is him driving around in public, running people <laughs> over. And he's committed, like, nearly 10 murders personally. And the FBI like, we can't figure out how to pin it on this man. Oh, but when you just watch, like, 10 episodes in a row and it's just Tony Soprano walking into business and beating people the fuck up in broad daylight. <laughs> how you doing, Mike? I guess, like, it's one of those, though, if those people that are getting beaten up by him know who he is, then no one's going to press charges or, like, you know, um, confess about it or anything. And one of the things I really enjoy about The Sopranos is the genuine enthusiasm from fans of the show. Like, even to this day, you'll find people, like, talking about it and reminiscing about favourite moments. And there's, like, a couple of YouTube channels that, to this day, continue to upload very high-quality clips from the show, which will be credited, like, on screen right now, because they're no doubt where I'm going to get up most of the clips for this episode. And one of them is just a guy called Tony Soprano. <laughs> he's like, you know, he's Soprano's clips, Tony Soprano, with a picture of Tony Soprano. And just, I remember something that, like, just one evening, I was just, I think it just popped up on my feed. So I'd, like, I think I got a clip for a fact theme video or something. And it's just mm-hmm. like, oh, every whacking in the Sopranos by Tony Soprano or something like that. I went, okay. And I, Joe, you when know, you scroll down when the video's playing, see what you're like, queue up next. And I just saw the top comment that said something like, man, Tony Soprano's a real gangster. <laughs> Recording himself in HD, <laughs> committing all these murders and uploading it to YouTube. <laughs> and I don't know why <laughs> fucking sent me. <laughs> oh no, oh no. <laughs> But just like that comment absolutely just fucking sent my sides into orbit. <laughs> just wow, you know Tony Soprano's a gangster when he records himself in HD killing people. He uploads his own crimes to YouTube. So what a fucking gangster. Like another one is, um, like it's, it's another Tony Soprano kill. It's when he shoots a guy and the way he does it is that he hides a gun in a fisher's mouth. Look at this baby, I caught right up the point here. <laughs> and then the top comment is, well, I can't believe how lucky Tony is that the fishy caught out of a gun. <laughs> and that's what I mean. It just like, and it recontextualizes the entire show. Of like, I watched it the first time years ago as a drama. Then when I rewatched mm-hmm. it, it's like, you know, just appreciating the acting and like, you know, just how well made it is. And now I can just watch it as just like an out of context comedy. I've gotten three separate experiences from this one show. That's impressive. And to this day, it's still talked about as one of the greatest TV shows to ever air. Yeah, it's a, from start to finish. Yeah, it yeah. was a watershed moment for television. It's noted as being the moment where, like, you know, prestige television became a thing. I um I remember growing up always hearing it's The Sopranos on The Wire. That is like TV at its finest. Yeah, and earlier when we said it's before our time, people were probably in there thinking, well, didn't this air during the 90s? It's like, yes, it did, but me and Lucas were like like 10 and 11 respectively during the 90s. So it's, well, I mean, technically we were born in the 90s. We were born in the 90s, so like, it aired in 90, 90s. started airing in 99. Right. So I just yeah. wanted to clarify that for anyone. Like, surely you were you know, alive when it was airing. It's like we were, but we were too young to watch something where people get shot and killed. Mm-hmm. I was still there watching, like, X-Men 97 every Saturday morning. And, you know, it's just... And years later, I and mean, I watched it, and it's like, man, you know, this still holds up. Like, a few things, maybe not 
age so well. Like, you know, some of the effects are a bit wonky. Um, uh, like, some of the scenes like, are unintentionally funny just because the way that they're framed, but still absolutely holds up just like the strength of Gandolfini's acting and the, you know, the supporting cast. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I've been working with the government, right, Tom? Don't say it. And Lucas, once again, we're going to go on a wild tone shift here, much in the vein of the Soprano show itself, and talk about Tony Soprano's interests and hobbies. And one of his interests, which I'm not, you know, kind of surprised that he didn't lean into, is nice, big, bright Hawaiian shirts. It is indeed, yes. I, I completely forgot that's a thing, because we made a fact theme video about the fact that Tony Soprano dresses like an arsehole a lot of the time, and wears like really <laughs> loud shirts in a lot of scenes. And that actually resulted in a member of the mob contacting writer David Chase to yell at him about how unrealistic the way Tony Soprano dresses was, which was actually referenced in the show. And apparently a point of contention with actual mob bosses is that Tony Soprano wears shorts in one episode. <laughs> And the story goes that James Gandolfini got a phone call at about three in the morning from an unlisted number. When he picked it up, he's like, hello, who is this? And like, mob bosses don't wear shorts. Remember that. And he told <laughs> David Chase, and David Chase like, yeah, I've, I've got a lot of similar calls from my like unlisted numbers like early in the morning. And if anyone curious, like, was that really the mob? It very well may have been because apparently members of the mob fucking love the Sopranos to the point where... The FBI, when they were consulted for, you know, like, references for the show, of like, is this realistic, that sort of thing, they would tell them that, yeah, we're actually wiretapping mob bosses right now, and every time The Sopranos airs, they talk about it the next day. <laughs> like, they were wiretapping actual members of the Mafia, and they would talk about The Sopranos. I mean, to be fair, it makes sense, because, you know, people like representation, and they were finally being represented in a, you know, pretty convincing way. And they weren't happy about the fact that Tony Soprano wore shorts, and they referenced this <laughs> in an episode where Tony Soprano's at a barbecue, and, like, you know, a, a boss above him just looks and goes, Tony, 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 bosses don't wear shorts. John said he went to a cookout at your house. Yeah. Don doesn't wear shorts. All right, come on, come on. Elevator, sir. Is it The Sopranos or is it something else where it's the meme of him like sitting in the swimming pool or whatever? No, uh, that's The Sopranos, which is him sitting like in the swimming pool. Yeah. Yeah. And there's so many just like good reaction images from like The Sopranos of just Tony Sopranos doing random things. Like I said, him <laughs> angrily eating deli meat or yelling at his wife for not getting the right orange juice. It says with pulp. You like it with pulp? Not this much. He has a sentimental attachment towards animals as he had been traumatized by the loss of his childhood dog, whose name was Tippy. When he goes to confront mm. Angie Bonpensiero as she is walking her poodle, the dog greets Tony in a friendly manner, which Tony reciprocates. And it's just the idea of, like, you know, just one of those things, like, you know, hardened mob boss loves dogs. And that's why you get so pissed off about the scene where they let the dog die. Yes, it's um, uh, one of his, uh, like, members of his crew um, on, like, a drug binge accidentally kills their dog, which is, again, another moment of unintentional comedy. Or maybe intentional, that's like... It's hard not to read it as comedy, even though the subject matter is very dark, because it's an intervention. And during the intervention, they talk about how the character accidentally killed their dog by sitting on it and breaking its neck, which is a very mm. sad thing. But just, it keeps cutting back to Tony Soprano, a guy who's personally killed eight people, getting increasingly flustered about the fact they killed the dog and the fact that no one's talking about it. Oh, you killed the dog? What'd you do that for? It was an accident. Oh, what was it, barking? He sat on the while he was high. Oh, Jesus Christ. I fell asleep. Yeah, they just treat it as like, yeah, well, that happened. And, and just the fact he just keeps circling back to Tony, like, but why the dog? Still, this thing with the dog. How could you not see it on a chair? You're getting emotional, Tony. That's because I know what it's like to lose a pet. And this is the fact that he gives a shit. He's like, again... I'm not sure if it was intentionally hilarious, but watching back, it kind of is. And then the whole scene ends with them kicking the fuck out of the guy they went to the intervention for, <laughs> which is just the Sopranos in microcosm. Of, here, we're here to help you, ends with them kicking the shit out of him. I told you I had the flu. I said my piece, Chrissy. Great. I can't even defend myself now? No one's attacking you, though, Chris. No! Guys, guys, please! Come on! Oh. 
God, yeah. That reminds me of the excellent intervention scene in It's Always Sunny. We're just like, okay, so like, should we bring a gun with us? It's like, no, dude, you don't bring a gun to an intervention. Goddamn fire! Seems like he gives a lot more of a shit about animals than human beings. And there's a term I believe was coined to describe Tony Soprano and then later applied to the protagonists of shows that were aping the formula and success of the Sopranos. And I believe it's difficult men, which is a term used to describe like a main character from a TV show who is, you know, objectively a terrible person, but is nonetheless incredibly charismatic and compelling to watch. And that, mm. you know, the descriptor is applied to characters like Tony Soprano, Walter White, um, Vic Mackey from The Shield, which is one of those like prestige television shows that often gets overlooked in these discussions. Dexter. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and um, I guess like I was about to name another one, but I guess I could name another two because I was about to say, um, oh, I think in The Walking Dead, like Negan fits that category pretty well. But I guess also Rick does. Because they are basically two sides of the same coin. When he starts, you know, by the, like, you know, the end of the second season when he's personally killed like, at least a dozen people. Mm hmm. And that's like um, uh, just a term that was used to describe like the character of Tony Soprano, like a difficult man. But like, you know, he's objectively a bad guy, but is just so compelling to watch. Either, yeah, that and like the, you know, it seems from the clips that I looked at, he seems like a very, you know, charming and amicable person. But he's also, yeah. But he's also willing to murder you. This was great. During his stay in the hospital after his shooting, he is seen reading a book about dinosaurs. <laughs> Just the idea of a mob boss reading a book on dinosaurs is so fucking funny. Like I said, it's there's so many moments where you know on a rewatch I just burst out laughing. Oh, dinosaurs! My kids can't get enough. Yeah, yeah, me too. Ever since I saw King Kong kick their ass. And finally, it notes here that Tony Soprano is a fan of classic rock. And there are many examples of like rock music being used throughout the show, but inarguably the best like example of it being used is the final shot of the show. And Lucas, you said you've not watched the Sopranos, but are you aware of how it ends? Like as pop culture osmosis um, led to you learning about how the Sopranos ends? Because it has one of the most controversial endings in television history. So, as far as I'm aware, that meme I talked about earlier, I would have thought was from the last episode. Um, but other than that, I have no real idea how it ends or anything, so I'd prefer not to be spoiled too hard. Well, that's the thing, the ending is ambiguous, which is what makes right. it so controversial. Because the ending is like ambiguous, and Lucas, we've talked about this in the past, what do people watching like TV shows and movies and playing video games fucking hate doing when it comes to the media they're consuming? What do you mean thinking about media, Carl? Why well, don't just calm down and perfectly calm? Oh, we can talk about whatever's bothering you. Yeah. Tony, this is crazy. In, like, in retrospect, a lot of people have come around and said it's actually one of the most genius and like, poignant endings to a show ever, but at the time, it was so controversial that HBO had like a massive letter writing campaign to be like, this fucking sucks. You just cut off in the middle of a sentence, what's that about? And then when you look back on it, it's like, actually, no, that perfectly fits the theme of the show. And in regards to classic rock, during that scene, the song Don't Stop Believing by Journey is playing. <laughs> right, okay. Which is great, because even if you didn't mind being spoiled, I still could have put a clip in, because Journey would <laughs> copyright strike us. <laughs> Can't be spoiled even if we wanted to. But yeah, just the fact that it had an ambiguous ending and people were annoyed because that meant they had to think about the show they just watched. And I guess, Lucas, because you don't want to be spoiled on the ending of The Sopranos, we can talk about another ambiguous ending from a piece of media that I'm a fan of that resulted in just just the creator being like, for fuck's sake. And, and that piece of media is The Thing, which similarly ends in an ambiguous manner with two characters sat there unsure if whether one of them is the thing or not and they just share a look and drink to their mutual um, uh, like demise what do we do why don't we just wait here for a little while see what happens A 
And the ending of the film is deliberately ambiguous. John Carpenter has never said one way or the other what the ending was supposed to mean or if any of the characters in that scene are a thing or not. And there is a story about when the film first premiered, John Carpenter went to a premiere and at the end was like asking people as they filtered out of the theater what they thought of the movie. And the lady came up to him and asked him, so in that last shot, um, who, who was the thing? Was McCready a thing? Was Childs a thing? To which John Carpenter responded, it's supposed to be ambiguous. Who do you think was the thing? To which the person asking the question responded, oh, I hate that. <laughs> Wouldn't it have been much better if one of them just looked straight to camera and went, turns out I'm the thing. And just, yeah, I think that sums it up of, uh, you know, a thing I'm very passionate about is the idea of media literacy, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that is the most crushing example of the fact that some people just do not give a fuck. They, if it's not mm -hmm. spelled out to them in the text, and even when it is, sometimes they'll still complain because it's not obvious enough, even when it super is. We talked about Breaking Bad. Remember when people got mad that that ending was quote-unquote ambiguous? Oh, yeah, the guy lying on the floor with a bullet wound. With, like, police coming his way. It's like, yeah, but he could have got out. Walter White always figures out a way. So for fuck's sake. Or even just like, you know, in, like, you know, watching the show, we talked about like, difficult men. And, like, you know, just interpreting it, like, you know, antithetical to the way that the original creator intended. Of, like, Anna Gunn from, like, you know, getting hate mail from Breaking Bad fans mm. for playing a character who is, like, the wife to a guy who melts people in bathtubs and shoots children. Always, just, always like, you know, working with people who shoot children. She, she got hate mail because she's, like, you know, was a wet blanket to Walter White's um, uh, empire. And it's like, okay. She was pretty reasonable in her responses and ended up supporting him way more than she probably should have done when he was a meth-dealing murderer. Yeah, no, you know, in regards to Breaking Bad, there is uh, one of my, like, you know, just favourite examples of just missing the point super fucking hard is the fact that the line, I am the one who knocks, became, like, an example of, like, oh, this is the most badass line in the series. Everyone always seemingly forgets that he says that line to his terrified wife. I am the one who knocks. It is a man screaming at his terrified wife about how about how big of a deal he is because she dares to question his ego. You think you see? Do you know how much I make a year? I mean, even if I told you, you wouldn't believe it. And just the fact that Skylar tries to outplay Walter in their relationship and gain some power back against him, mm -hmm. yeah, he does not like that and is willing to ab abuse his wife to try and shut her down. And perhaps, Lucas, one day we will do, like, you know, a wiki weekends on the character of Walter White or another person from the, uh, the Breaking Bad universe. But for today, mm -hmm. hopefully people have enjoyed this discussion about Tony Sopranos and the Sopranos universe as a whole. Mostly, I just wanted an excuse to put in some of the clips I'm a fan of, like Tony Sopranos <laughs> playing Mario Kart. But it is a fantastic show. I'd highly recommend watching it if you are able to get your hands on it. It's just... It's... Even if you're not a fan of, like, the show itself, just... It's such an important television show. Like, it was, the, you know, the beginning of what was called, like, the golden age of television. And it is the reason we got stuff like Breaking Bad and The Wire and Better Call Saul and The Shield and all these, like, you know, prestige television shows. Yeah, for sure. And, it, again, as I mentioned, like, what, 20-something years later, it's still recognised as one of the greatest. Well, that's the thing, right? You know, 20 years later, we're making a YouTube video on it because I wanted to just put clips into the show that I find amusing. <laughs> if that doesn't say something's got longevity, I don't know what else does. But yes, if you're a fan of the show and like to continue talking about it, we have a, a Discord link below where you can continue the conversation about this video or make suggestions for other things to cover in the future. But besides that, I hope everyone at home has a lovely day and we'll see you all next time.